Well, hello and welcome along. It's unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. This is the part of your Saturday afternoon here on Premier Christian Radio when you'll regularly hear Christians and non-Christians getting together to dialogue and debate. Got a great show coming up for you involving Frank Turek and David Smalley. I'll be introducing them and what they're going to be debating on the show today in a moment's time. But unbelievable, if you're not familiar, is the program where you can hear these kinds of conversations week in, week out. You can find out more at the website, subscribe to the podcast and find out more about Unbelievable, the conference 2017. That's at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. And lots of people have been getting in touch about the conference. They're excited that it's back. It's on Saturday, the 13th of May this year, themed Why Christ? Discover how Jesus is the answer to life, the universe and everything. Going to be joined by people like Professor John Lennox, Andy Bannister, Beth Grove, uh, Dr. Jerry Johnston, Dr. Jeremiah J. Johnston, Ruth Jackson, Jamie Cutteridge, and we've also added Sarah Foster of Fanda Apologetics to the bill as well. So uh, the the conference just keeps growing year in and year out and uh, early bird tickets available until I think about the beginning of March. But uh, why not book in now? Don't don't miss out on the, the early bird ticket price. Uh, more details, uh, you can find out all about it at the website. That's premier.org.uk slash whychrist. premier.org.uk slash why Christ? We've also got the usual offer of getting the, the DVD from last year free if you book tickets for this year's conference and that kind of thing, plus group discounts, student discounts and all the rest of it. Uh, so uh, do check it out. Unbelievable the Conference 2017, Saturday the 13th of May at the brewery again, premier.org.uk forward slash why Christ. So a very exciting show coming up for you today. We'll be hearing some of your feedback towards the end of the program as well. And straight after Unbelievable on the profile, you can hear Lord David Alton talking about his life and faith journey with Martin Eden, Premier's political editor. But let's get into today's discussion. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Well, welcome along to today's programme. And we've got such an interesting discussion for you on Unbelievable today. We're asking, have atheists been stealing from God? Frank Turek is a Christian apologist, author and host of the US radio call-in show Cross Examined. I was on the show just recently, actually, and he's well known for speaking on the case against atheism and for Christianity. Uh, lots of clips of him debating atheists at his seminars are available online. Uh, his most recent book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, presents a number of ways in which Frank believes atheists borrow from a Christian worldview. Uh, our atheist guest today is David Smalley. He's the host of an atheist talk show, Dogma Debate, which airs online. It's a popular podcast, uh, often hosts debates between believers and atheists, so somewhat similar to Unbelievable in that way. Uh, he's a former Christian, now a media activist for secular humanism. He founded the Secular Media Group. He also works as a humanist celebrant. Uh, you can find Frank at crossexamined.org. And uh, you can find David at dogmadebate.com. And today, our two show hosts are going to be joining me, another show host, uh, debating the claim in Frank's book, Stealing from God, that atheists have stolen reason and logic from a theistic worldview to make their case for atheism. So, uh, Frank and David, welcome along to the program. Wonderful being with you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's great to have you both on, gents. Um, I, I'll start with Frank, if that's all right, Frank. You're both new to the programme, but Frank, uh, we haven't had you on before. Um, Frank, uh, I've, I've heard you spoken of so often, though, in apologetics circles. Um, your fame precedes you. Uh, and you're, you're kind of one of those people who's kind of an out there guy. You're, you're very, a bit of an extrovert. And, and looking at some of your talks and so on on, on YouTube, I can see why that is. Uh, you, you kind of have a certain way of presenting. Um, have you always been this kind of of a character have you always been a bit larger than life in that way well i don't know about fame you must have been talking to my mom <laughs> because uh she's my biggest fan but i'm from new jersey so i don't know i guess i've been kind of an extrovert my whole life and if you're not an extrovert in new jersey you're going to get into trouble um and the folks here in the u.s know what i'm talking about but uh yeah i've just been always interested in uh in reason and arguments and that kind of thing and when I got into apologetics, it was because I came to faith through apologetics, and so I always had an interest in pursuing it in a vocational way. It really didn't really start that until about five years ago when I went full-time doing this. Tell us a little bit then about how you became a Christian, Frank. 
I was brought up in uh, the Roman Catholic Church because I lived in New Jersey, and it's law in the U.S. that if you live in New Jersey, you have to be a Roman Catholic. I don't know if you know that, but uh, I went to Catholic high school, but it was probably my fault. I, I just never really knew who Jesus was. I always believed in God. I always knew there had to be some kind of creator out there, but I didn't know who Jesus was, and it wasn't until I went into the Navy and uh, met the son of a Methodist minister uh, and he actually took me to a Baptist service, and I, it was, I was intrigued by it because I, I learned a lot in the service, and, and I had a lot of questions for my friend who was in uh, navigator school with me in the Navy. And he said, oh, you have, you have questions? You need to get Josh McDowell books. And so I read Evidence Demands a Verdict and More Than a Carpenter and some other books, and that's the way I came to faith, uh, knowing who I thought Jesus was, the Savior of the world. And... Um, I understood the gospel at that point, and so since I came to faith through apologetics, when when I had the opportunity after the Navy to attend a seminary here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live now, Southern Evangelical Seminary, headed by Norman Geisler, uh, I I took the opportunity, and that was back in 1993, and uh, one thing led to another. I began doing seminars with Dr. Geisler, wrote a few books with him, and uh, then started an organization called crossexamine.org back in 2006 and then went pretty much full time with that in about 2011 2012 and crossexamined also of course the the name of the radio show that you present mm -hmm. and and w with the book and and the, the book what i like about it is it, it it details a lot of the encounters you've had at some of the talks you've given with atheists um, i mean this kind of almost strikes me as the thing you you most enjoy actually is is interacting with skeptics and atheists um once you've delivered your your evidence for god or whatever what what, what kind of interest you turns you on about that well, I just I think it's much more interesting to have uh, dialogue rather than just lectures, because I think you can get to the point a lot quicker. And uh, I know David uh, David Smalley, who's uh, the discussion uh, friend here, is the same way. I mean, he wants to interact with people, and I want to interact with people. And I'm I'm actually frustrated by s uh, dueling speech debates, if you know what I mean, uh, Justin. I mean, I know that's the way you formally debate. You put out a 20 minute uh, uh, statement, and the other guy does, and then you have 10, 15 minute rebuttals, and and those are fine. But at some point, I like to interact with. people. People. I, I, I like to have the person press me, and then I want to press the other person because I want to get at the issue that I think is really the issue that needs to be discussed. And too often in the dueling speech debates, you don't have that opportunity. So I enjoy the interaction. Well, it's great to have you on the program today. Just give us a little flavor of what the book is all about. Um, you've called it Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And I think there are about five or six areas that you cover, and, and you have you've very cleverly turned them into an acronym for crime, um, of different areas where you think uh, atheists steal from God to make their, their atheistic case. Do you want to just give us a quick overview of that? Yeah, I'll give you the real quick overview is the acronym CRIME, C-R-I-M-E-S, and, and it's my contention that atheists, particularly materialistic atheists, are stealing from God these aspects of reality. C stands for causality. R stands for reason. I stands for information and intentionality, M stands for morality, E for evil, and S for science. It's my contention that they're stealing these things from God when they say that any of these things actually point to atheism. So probably the easiest, quickest example I could get, it's not our topic today, but uh, we're going to talk about reason today. So uh, evil, for example, I, I know that evil is a big issue, uh, not only for uh, atheists, but for Christians as well. And frequently atheists will say, well, there's too much evil in the world. Therefore, there, you know, there can't be a God. And, and my point is, I'm just borrowing here from C.S. Lewis, there can't be something that's evil unless there's something that's good. And good can't exist in an objective sense unless God exists, because by definition, his nature is what we mean by the standard of good. So if you're an atheist and a materialist who believes that all that exists are materials, there can't be this ontologically grounded, immaterial reality known as good by your own definition. So if you're going to say that there's too much evil in the world, you're actually presupposing a standard of good, which presupposes God's nature. So you're stealing from God to argue against him. And I try and do that with those other aspects of the book as well, with causality, reason, information, intentionality, morality, and science. So the premise of the book is, what if your best arguments to doubt God show that he actually exists? It's, it's a, it's a 
fun way of kind of inverting things. And uh, we're obviously going to be debating one of those specific areas today on the show, reason, mm-hmm. the, the R in crimes. Um, but uh, we'll come back to you in a moment, uh, Frank. I'm going to swap over now to our other sure. show host, and, and that is, of course, David Smalley, who is from the Dogma Debate Show. Uh, David, welcome along to the programme. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. David, my listeners may not be terribly familiar with your show, though in many ways we share certain aspects of what we do. I know that you regularly do uh, engage with Christians and believers of various kinds. But tell us about your own journey, because you you were at one time an, an evangelical Christian, weren't you? I was, yeah. I was, I was in the ministry. I, I do have to say... Um, I don't know how many people in the UK are actually going to think it's a joke that you have to be Roman Catholic by law in New Jersey. They might actually believe that coming from the States. Uh, So Frank (laughs) was joking about that, just so you know. Um, And and I have to say, I I agree with Frank about the dueling speech debate thing. I much prefer engaging discussions, and that's really why I started doing what I'm doing. Um, Early on, you know, I was was an evangelical Christian. I was Baptist. I was kind of going around door knocking and and getting you know t- telling people about Jesus as I was a, a young, young teenager, and um, you know I, I just I had this moment where uh, I started questioning how do I know I have it right? You know my little small town in in Texas, we're the ones that have it all figured out, and everyone else is either going to hell or they need to be saved quickly or they're going to lose it because my preacher is the right guy, my pastor is the right leader. Um, you know, how do I know I've got it right? What if it's some church in North Carolina or some church in Los Angeles? Um, so I, I really started to to really challenge my own views, and, and I thought, you know, there are so many different denominations, there are so many different views of God, and and different, you know, when when one person describes Jesus and then someone else describes Jesus, it, it doesn't even sound like they're talking about the same person. So. Um, being a Bible believing Christian and, and being a caring individual that I was, I, I, I said, you know, I want to resolve these issues. I want to clear up the confusion. I'm starting to get confused and, and I want to help other people. So I'm going to get so close to God that, that I can finally figure out what the right religion is, what the right belief system is and what the right interpretation of the Bible is. And that sent me on a search for the truth. And it took me about 13, 14 years, um, deep dive study, reading the Bible cover to cover, not just the parts the preachers point out and do wonderful sermons on, but literally reading the whole Bible. Almost everyone who says, yes, I've read the Bible, have not actually read the Bible. Um, Reading the entire Bible, talking with theology professors, talking with my preacher, and then going to talk with a preacher who disagrees with my preacher. Um, I did all of these things over the years, and and I, I... sort of summed it up in, a, in my first book called Baptized Atheist. Um, but that was really my journey of, of, of going, I, I want to figure this stuff out. I want to have the knowledge. And when I was baptized, I, I had so many doubts. I was so afraid. And the reason I was afraid, at the, and this, this happened, this is the reason I called my book Baptized Atheist. The reason I was afraid, um, the moment I was dunked, I just thought, what, what am I doing? I, I I feel like I've been handed a jersey, and I'm on the team. I don't know any of the plays. I don't know what we stand for. Um, our team seems to be led in 14 different directions. I, 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 I don't have any consistency here. I have so many questions. I don't think I'm good enough to call myself a Christian. I really need a better handle on this stuff before I carry the label and walk around selling something I don't quite buy myself. And so... I think the pastor saw some confusion on my face because I, as I was standing there dripping wet, he walked over and he put his hand on my shoulder and we never looked at each other. He just leaned down and he said, uh, David, you know, you can't just say you believe you have to know it to be true in your heart. And he, he tapped on my chest when he said that and he, he walked away and immediately I regretted my decision to be baptized. Not, not because I was an atheist at that moment, but because I didn't feel like I was good enough to wear the label of Christian. I didn't, I didn't have it together. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I couldn't go door knock. I couldn't tell people about Jesus. I didn't believe half the stuff that the preacher was saying about Jesus. And so I went on this long journey to get close to God and figure this all out and get rid of this uneasy feeling. 
And I got so close to God, I, I saw that there wasn't one. Uh, reading the Bible, everything starts to fall apart. Uh, the Bible is a very immoral book. It is not where we should get our morality from. Um, God is more of a, of a uh, tyrant or a dictator in the Bible. He's not this loving, peaceful, sweet guy that people talk about when they refer to God. In fact, I think most of the people, when they refer to God as being loving and their best friend, they're, they're, they're talking about a God they've invented, not a God that's been presented in the actual Bible. And so um, when I wanted to start having those sorts of discussions online, I found those discussions to be very angry toward one another, both on both sides. Uh, Christians would be very nasty to atheists. Atheists would be very condescending to, to Christians and go, oh, this is just you know Santa Claus for adults, and you have your own version of, of, of your mythology that you hold on to. And it's so insulting back and forth. And so I started a blog at the time called dogmadebate.com, and it was for me to – I would put a post up and then let Christians and atheists come and debate. And when someone would be nasty to each other, rather than deleting the comment and get rid of it, I would leave it there. I would reply to the comment and say, do you think that's the best way to get this person on your side? And I exposed the bad arguments on both sides. And people flocked to it. They loved uh, reading it. And so we – and I was also doing radio on the, on, uh, on the back end, but it was just like mainstream radio, mainstream television, voiceover, stuff like that. And so I, I finally found a way to marry my two passions of uh, – you know chasing down reason and logic, talking with people about their beliefs. My education is all in the background in, in, in psychology and, and, and world religions. And so I got to marry all of that together by, by starting Dogma Debate as a podcast. And now we're on, uh, I believe, five uh, AM, FM radio stations, as well as we just signed a deal with Podcast One in L.A. And now we're doing a big L.A. launch party at the Comedy Store on March 25th. Uh, so um, that's kind of my story and, and, and how I got to where I am today. Well, what a, what a fascinating story as well. I wish we had time to get into some of those things that led you obviously away from Christian faith. Uh, that won't be the focus of our discussion today, though. Um, obviously, the, we've covered those issues a number of times in other debates. But um, it, it's great. Uh, three radio ho show hosts um, talking to each other. I'm moderating this one and, and letting you guys duke it out for today's programme, of course. But I'm looking forward to hearing you both and, uh, and what you have to say. And uh, just before we get into the discussion here on Unbelievable, if you're listening and you'd like to respond to anything you hear on today's program do feel free to email me i try and read as many emails as i can at the end of every program uh, that's unbelievable at premier.org.uk uh, you can also of course follow on social media at unbelievable jb for the twitter account facebook.com slash unbelievable jb to follow on facebook uh, don't forget the show page as well on our website where you can find today's program links to my guests and loads more resources besides including of course information about the this year's unbelievable conference coming up on Saturday, the 13th of May. All available from premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Briley. Well, today on the program, uh, we're asking, have atheists been stealing from God? Uh, stealing from God is the uh, name of Frank Turek's most recent book, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And uh, Frank presents a number of ways in which he believes atheists borrow from a Christian worldview. Frank Turek is a Christian apologist, author and host of his own US radio call-in show, Cross Examined. And uh, in debate today with David Smalley, who's also a talk show host for Dogma Debate, uh, airs online and on some radio stations in the US. It's a popular a podcast as well uh, and uh, I'll make sure to give out the ways to, to find out more about them again both um, in a short moment's time uh, but we're going to get into the substance of today's discussion just uh, with the remaining 10 minutes or so we have in this section of the program at least uh, before we go to part two and Frank perhaps you can pick this up for us um, we're, we're focusing on chapter two of your book where you talk about reason and logic and why you don't believe atheists are entitled to reason and logic without God um, you, you make there's an interesting little intro paragraph to this particular chapter where you say the main point of this chapter is not to show that all arguments for atheism fail the main point of this chapter is to show that all arguments for anything fail if atheism is true do you just want to unpack that and, and how you approach this particular issue you have with atheism and reason Yes, Justin, because if everything is made of molecules, as many atheists today say, you know, Richard Dawkins is a materialist, uh, Christopher Hitchens was a materialist, Francis Crick was a materialist, that everything's made of molecules, 
then I think we have a big problem when it comes to our ability to reason. Number one, we can't explain where the immaterial laws of logic came from. Why do they exist? How can everything be made of molecules when the laws of logic aren't made of molecules, the laws of mathematics? Why is our universe rationally intelligible if we're just moist robots, if we're just molecules uh, just bumping around in our brains if we don't really have the ability to reason because we're completely controlled by the laws of physics, how can we rationally say we have warrant to believe anything? In fact, J.B.S. Haldane, who was an evolutionist himself, realized there was a problem with his materialistic worldview. He said this. He said, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to, to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be completely composed of atoms. I think he's on to something here that C.S. Lewis also talked about in one of his books. In fact, it was even um, Darwin who said this. He said, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which have been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? And in more modern times, uh, Thomas Nagel, an atheist uh, philosopher at NYU, wrote a seminal book a few years back called Mind and Cosmos, where he basically says that the neo-Darwinian view of the universe, the materialistic view of the universe, is, is almost certainly false. He says, conscious subjects and their mental lives are inescapable components of reality, not describable by the physical sciences. So let me just summarize this and unpack it a little bit more. Jason, uh, uh, I mean, Justin, Jason, I'm sorry, I'm recovering from a cold here. <laughs> That's all right. Justin. I'll forgive you that one, Frank. Justin and Go David, ahead. if we are just molecular machines, if we are just moist robots, then how can we trust anything we think, including the thought that atheism is true or that materialism is true or that Christianity is true or anything is true. It seems to me there has to be an immaterial reality. First of all, the laws of logic. Secondly, the fact that we have a mind and not just a brain, and later on in the program, maybe we'll give some evidence for that. Um, these things have to be the case. Otherwise, we can't trust anything we think because materialism alone can't account for these things and makes us nothing but moist robots. So when atheists, in my view, are trying to say they have reasons to uh, say there is no God, they have to steal reason from God in order to say so. So they're stealing from God while they're arguing against him. That's the premise of this chapter. And there's a lot more details in the chapter, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. Yeah, and a little bit later, I'll get you to kind of recount the, the story of the conversation you had with an atheist at one of your events that, that starts the chapter off. But um, right now, I'm, I'm going to let David respond, um, as I'm sure he's, he's eager to do. Um, and I'll just let you guys go for it for, um, you know, uh, for the next five or six minutes and, and, uh, and see what you have to say in response. But David, how, how would you respond to this whole issue that atheists have stolen reason from God? Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to get in on this. Uh, so... I think Frank's Frank. I'll, I'll just talk with you directly. Um, I, I think you're 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 the main mistake that I believe you're making is you're putting atheism on par with Christianity as sort of another belief system. And I know that that's what you believe. By the way, I, I did read your book, uh, Stealing from God, when I found out I was booked for this show. Um, and I, I I get what you're saying. I understand what you mean when you say that that atheists are stealing because we use reason and reason has to come from God. But that's that's really more of a deist argument. You're not really arguing for your God. I mean, a, a Muslim could say that a, a Muslim could say the same thing to you. They could say, "Look, whenever you use reason to justify Jesus, uh, you're just using the reason that comes from Allah and Muhammad to uh, prop up your false god." It, it doesn't really. Oh, I, I I agree. I uh, l l let me agree with you, David, right from the outset. This argument does not prove the Christian God. This, this this argument doesn't get you to Christianity. This argument seems, if my reasoning is right here, this argument just disproves atheism or materialism. It doesn't doesn't prove Christianity. I think I think the laws of logic and our inability to reason are better explained by theism, or if you want to say deism, fine, deism. 
But what can't be true is atheism or materialism. You have, you have to do a lot more work to get to Christianity. This argument doesn't get you there completely. It just seems, in my opinion anyway, to show you that materialism can't be true. Okay, I, 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 I get it. I understand where you're coming from. And, and that's the other thing, and that really goes back to the, to, the, to the first mistake, is that atheism is not on par with Christianity making a positive claim that, yeah. okay, Christians believe in Jesus, Muslims believe in, in Allah and Muhammad, and atheists believe no God exists out there at all. That's not really the position of most atheists. And I think, and, and I know you addressed this in the book, and I, I just, I, I, I think you're taking a very super hard line of atheism and, and, and attacking that when that's a very small percentage of, of, of actual atheists will make a positive claim and, and uh, positive claim to posit something so positive as I know for a fact there is nothing out there. Um, most atheists are agnostic atheists in that um, we realize that not all knowledge can be found. But no God that has been presented has enough evidence to believe in that God. So I don't believe in Zeus any more than I believe in Allah, any more than I believe in Krishna, any more than I believe in Yahweh or Elohim from the Bible. So I put all of those on par as these are all myths. If there's something else out there, we don't know what that is yet. But that, that doesn't mean I'm not an atheist because I, I don't have a theism that I support or believe in. So atheism is not making some solid positive claim that you can say, aha, your worldview falls apart because you don't know the answer to this question or that question, and you can't tell me where this started, so your entire worldview is false. It really works the other way around. For people who claim to have a personal relationship with the creator of the entire universe, the burden of proof is on you to provide evidence that that deity exists. For me to say, I don't believe that because your evidence falls apart, that's not a positive claim I'm making. We, we're going to take a quick break, gentlemen, and then I'll let uh, Frank come back in on this one. But um, it's great to the, you, you both know what you're talking about. You're both radio hosts. You're both making your arguments on both sides of this. Um, Frank Turek, who's my Christian guest on today's program, today's Unbelievable, uh, hosts a, a regular show in which he makes the case for Christianity. Um, and uh, Dogma Debate is what David Smalley hosts on a regular basis. And uh, he's an atheist and he's making the case for atheism on today's program. Hope you're enjoying their interaction and they'll be back uh, frank responding to david's um view there that you can't really equate atheism uh, as, a, as a worldview i suppose in the way that you can with christianity therefore um he doesn't have anything to really defend against uh with this accusation that atheists are stealing from christians when it comes to their belief in reason and logic we'll be back in a short moment's time this is unbelievable the show that brings christians and non-christians together for dialogue and debate every week here on premier christian radio in the uk my guest in the US and we're going to be continuing this conversation in a short moment's time. How can I know it's true? What about other religions? Why Christ? Join me, Justin Briley, to find answers at Unbelievable The Conference 2017. Discover how Jesus is the answer to life, the universe and everything and how to share him with others. Plus, I'll be launching my new book and sharing why I'm still a Christian after 10 years of talking with atheists. It's in London on Saturday the 13th of May with great speakers, including Professor John Lennox, Beth Grove, Andy Bannister and Jeremiah J. Johnston of our conference partner, the Christian Thinkers Society. Early bird tickets are available now at premier.org.uk slash whychrist. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to today's edition of Unbelievable, the show that brings Christians and non-Christians together in dialogue. We like to create conversations that matter here on the program. You can find out more. You can subscribe to the podcast. You can find details about this year's Unbelievable conference from our website, premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Uh, go there, uh, click through to all the links, and um, you can also, of course, find out more about the guests who are joining me on today's program, Frank Turek and David Smalley. Um, I'll remind you who they are in a moment's time. Um, Unbelievable uh, brought to you as part of Faith Explored every week here on Premier Christian Radio. And straight after today's show, you can hear The Profile. Uh, another Christian talks about their walk of faith and life. That's between four and five this afternoon. Um, Frank Turek is a Christian apologist, author and host of his own call-in show, a Christian one called Cross Examined in the US. He's well known for speaking on the case against atheism and for Christianity. And his most recent book, Stealing from God, presents a number of ways in 
which he believes atheists borrow from a Christian worldview to make their case as atheists. And today on the programme, we've been discussing one of those. Uh, reason, uh, Frank's contention, is that atheists um, have to kind of basically invent reason, um, but you can't really have reason without God in order to reason against God. Um, well, uh, in conversation, David Smalley from Dogma Debate, another talk show out there, but this time an atheist one, and uh, he's talking about uh, why he, he doesn't think that Frank can, can kind of make that kind of leap. Uh, and, and Frank, just in that last section, what David was effectively saying was um, he thinks you're kind of t- turning atheism into a worldview, which it, it's not. It's it's more a kind of an agnosticism. And so he's not required to say exactly what is and isn't out there in terms of immaterial laws of logic and that kind of thing. Um, and, and certainly doesn't feel like a god is going to help um, uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah, how do you come back to that? Well, I, I don't know David's complete worldview, and he's saying he doesn't have a worldview, but I would ask him, David, are you a materialist? Do you think everything's made of molecules, or do you think there's a, there's an immaterial realm out there? You know, I'm, I'm not really sure, Frank. Um, I, I, whenever, I, whenever I think about anything immaterial, like, say, cognition, uh, ideas, math problems, things that only exist in, in our minds um, – I, I look at it as the molecules in my brain, the, the physical brain matter, is creating that for me, or I'm creating it within that brain matter. So even though the the thoughts or words themselves may not be tangible, uh, they're derived from something that is. So – and and, and, let me, and and let me just be clear um, – I've gone back and forth. Is atheism a worldview? I, I don't really know. I mean it, it is a view of the world. I, I, I would be more apt to say if you want to say something about my worldviews, say humanism is my worldview. Humanism I can defend as I, I believe that humanism is the best way to operate in life, and that's something I can call a belief. But as far as me believing no God exists or being able to argue what, what are molecules and what, what isn't, I, I just – I, I just feel like that muddies the waters and gets us away from, you know, which God is this God we're supposed to be worshiping. And then the, the title of your book, Stealing from God, this, I, I, I just I, – I have another follow-up question for you. I'll wait and let you respond to that. But I, I – I, my worldview is humanism, so I, I don't really get into the, okay. to the materialistic – I, I was going to just leap in here, Frank, before you come back to David. I mean, David, you wouldn't then wear a label like uh, a naturalist or materialist. You, 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 you don't claim to know whether the world is made up simply of physical matter in that sense. I mean, methodological naturalism is something I would lean more towards than ontological naturalism. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to assert that certain things exist without knowing, and, and I'm also fluid. I'm, I'm open to changing my mind on these things. I don't think I have to know the answer to those questions in order to know that uh, you know a, a dead guy did not come back to life and walk on water. I mean, these these things are not connected, as far as I'm concerned. Well, they would be connected, David, because if it's just Made, if everything's just molecules, then obviously a dead guy can't come back to life based on what we know. But if there's more than molecules out there, if there's something beyond nature, something we would call super nature, supernatural, then that would be possible. And without getting into other arguments here, we could talk about the cosmological argument that shows there seems to be a supernatural realm out there, or the moral argument, which is which impinges on your worldview of of, of uh, humanism. Without getting into those other arguments, um, I think we can say that there's an immaterial realm that we're using right now to communicate. You know, there's there's these laws of logic that you and I are using right now to have this discussion, to have this debate. And in fact, in order for us to have a debate, you have to think you're closer to this immaterial standard than me, and I have to think I'm closer to that standard than you, and we have to share this 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 common these common laws called the laws of logic to even communicate. In order in order for us to even communicate, in order for us not to just be locked in our own skulls, there has to be these universal, immaterial laws of logic. And I'm saying if you're a thinking person, and I know you are, you have to have some explanation for why those exist. I don't think you can have a coherent or – that's not the right word. I don't think you, I don't think you can have a, a worldview that has enough explanatory power and scope if you don't address – 
uh, what we all know seems to be true, that there are, there's an okay. immaterial reality out there. What explains that from an atheistic perspective? And uh, I'll, I'll ask you that question, and I'll just, just let me add one other thing to that. What explains immaterial reality from uh, an atheistic perspective if you're admitting there is an immaterial reality? And then secondly, if you're claiming that you don't know about these things, you're not an atheist. You're an agnostic. Well, uh, like I said, uh, atheism deals with belief. Um, if, if I'm a theist, I have a theism I ascribe to. If I'm an atheist, I am without that theism. So if you are an agnostic who says it's impossible to know either way, I'll ask you a follow-up question. What God do you believe in? What theism do you ascribe to? If you say, I don't believe in any of them yet, but I'm open, that's agnostic atheism, and that's the vast majority of atheists on the planet. So agnostic atheism is a thing. It's where I am. It's where most people are. To answer your first question, I have to ask you this. Ancient Egypt, before, before anything about the Bible came along, before these guys had no contact, no thought of God, uh, they worshipped, in, in your opinion, false idols, um, they're, they're, they're you know, scratching things in caves and making all these hieroglyphs. Um, did they have reason? Did they have logic? Did, did they have morality? Did they treat each other with respect sometimes? Of course, there were, there were bad people in, in all eras. But, but how do you think they operated day in and day out before a Bible came along, before Jesus? Of, of course. Yeah, yes, of course, David. The, the Bible's not necessary to understand reason or morality. In fact, the Bible presupposes you already understand reason and morality in order to even understand what it says. This is called, as you know, prolegomena in theology. There are certain things you have to know before you can even understand what the Bible says. You don't need the Bible to know logic. You need logic to know the Bible. You don't, you don't need the Bible to know morality. You, you, in some sense, need morality to know the Bible. And so uh, these things... Uh, are what philosophers call the difference between the order of being and the order of knowing. Uh, you can know something uh, and not be able to justify why it exists. Like you can know that, say, torturing babies for fun is wrong, even if you can't justify why torturing babies for fun is wrong. But torturing babies for fun is wrong. The only way it can be wrong is if there's an order of being. In other words, there's a being out there whose nature is good, and that nature dictates that torturing babies for fun is wrong. So there's a difference between, uh, uh, another way of putting it, as you know, is the difference between epistemology, that's how you know something, and ontology is that something exists. I'm, I'm asking the ontological question. Why do the laws of logic exist? Why, why do we have the ability to reason? These are ontological questions, not how how do we how do we reason or how do we know certain things okay. i'm asking the question why do these things even exist to begin with okay these things exist because humans developed them with our material brains with with a material brain you can have an immaterial thought cognition the the the, the process of thinking may be immaterial but it starts within matter it starts with inside us and as far as the morality argument of knowing why it, it's it's wrong to torture a baby there's not only one way to know that you don't just have to have a God in order to believe that's wrong or even to be able to justify that's wrong. I have a very easy way to explain this. I am an objective uh, moralist. I, I, I believe that uh, there, is, there is objective morality out there. I probably said that wrong, but uh, I, I believe there, there is objective morality. And, and this is how you determine that. Um, there's, there's two things. It's reducing of human harm, the increasing of human flourishing. How do we know that? How do we, how do we measure that? Well, the mechanism by which to determine that is the veil of ignorance. If you don't know if you were going to be the baby or the person torturing the baby, you're behind a veil of ignorance before the situation starts. You don't know if you're going to be the baby or the person torturing. Do you want to allow the torturing of babies? Well, it's pretty clear that nobody wants to be tortured, so you're not going to allow that to happen. That's how you can morally judge things through a veil of ignorance to realize if they're right or wrong. I don't need a God in my life to realize hurting people is bad. Uh, David, uh, l l uh, thanks for that because that, I like Rawls's veil of ignorance. Um, 
but let me point out that I'm not I'm not asking the question about epistemology. Again, I'm asking the question about ontology. The veil of ignorance might be how you know something is wrong, but the veil of ignorance doesn't tell us why torturing babies for fun is wrong. But let's not go down the morality thing anyway because we're getting too far afield. Let's go back to reason for a second. You said that the laws of logic and, and – if I'm taking words out of your mouth the wrong way, correct me. You're saying that these are human conceptions, that we conceive of these laws. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. If they're just human conceptions, let me ask you this. Before there were any human minds on Earth, was the statement, there are no human minds on Earth, true? Frank, that it's just a nonsensical question. That There couldn't be a question before human minds were on it. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not talking about the order of being or the order of knowing here. I'm talking about the order of being again. I'm talking about right. But was it true know, propositionally? But, but we have to understand the order of knowing before we can talk about the order of being. It doesn't make sense for a question to exist before human minds existed to think of the question. It's putting the cart before the horse. It makes no, no sense. No, 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 no. All right, for, forget the thought. There are no human minds on Earth, right? And there's a rock on Earth. Was it true before there were any human minds on Earth that there was a rock on Earth? Again, the concept of truth and lie and incorrect and correct and log logic and reason happened within the human mind through evolution. So it doesn't make sense to ask the question before those minds exist. Then, 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 David, that very statement you just made is a self-defeating statement because you are saying it's objectively true. There are no objective truths. That's what you just said by that's, saying that. That's not what I said. Well, that's, 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 the, that's the implication of what you said because you're saying – your statement that says the laws of logic are human conceptions. You don't think that statement is a human conception. You think that statement is objectively true, correct? Hmm. That feels like a trap. <laughs> it is a trap because it's a self-contradiction. No, I, I think this is just – this is such a stretch and muddying the waters of philosophy to try to explain away the fact that you have no evidence for your God. And so what you're no, no, trying – No, no, wait, wait, wait. David, 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 forget to, God to for a second. Sounds like, to me what this sounds like is someone calls the police, the cops show up, and they go, hey, what happened? Someone broke into my house. Okay, give us a description. Well, you can't. You can't prove this guy doesn't exist, so – excuse me? Well, you know, uh, cops are, are wrong about a lot of stuff. Yeah, so what? Where is this person you're claiming broke into your house? Let's talk about the laws of logic and reality. This is so David, ridiculous to me. But, but David, David, the, the whole premise of our discussion today is on this one issue of reason. That's what we agreed to have the discussion on. Um, we could talk about these other issues, other issues in another show if Justin is kind enough to have us back on. I'm uh, just trying to any stay time, on this guys. Any time. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm just going to come in myself, guys, because I've, I've been fascinating just sitting back and listening to you guys go for it uh, in one direction and another. I mean, you, you're you're sounding a bit unprepared there, David, to kind of answer Frank's question: Was there a time when humans? did not exist now obviously we can all say yes of course there was that's that's true but you're saying that kind of truth and that kind of logic and reason that it takes to to come up with that as a truth only exists in our physical mind it, there's no truth out there that would exist if we weren't thinking those truths is that kind of what i'm getting from you it's uh, not David? that i'm unprepared what i'm trying to tell you is it doesn't matter if I know the answer yes or no to a question of objective truth. It doesn't matter whether I know the answer yes or no. Does immaterial – does this immaterial thing none, – none, I don't have to answer yes or no to this question in order to be able to say I'm an atheist and I do not believe in the evidence that you present for your God. And so when you say, well, then, then you can't know anything, you can't prove anything, that's just – it's just – that's going to lead to absurdity because my position is only that your position is not true. That doesn't mean it, – it, it's a false dichotomy to say, well, either you're right or I'm right. And so if you don't know the answer to this question, therefore my God is real. That just, that just doesn't comport. Let, so let, David, that, well, I, David, I agree with you. I, I, could be, I could be right about this point and wrong about Jesus and everything else. I, I agree with you. I'm not saying that because there's objective truth 
and there are objective moral or forget moral values. There's objective truth and objective laws of logic and objective laws of mathematics that Christianity is true. That's not my point. My point is, if Christianity is true, that explains it. And if these things do exist, if these laws of logic exist, if these laws of mathematics exist, atheism, materialistic atheism, necessarily is false about that point. Yeah, uh, once again, you are taking atheism and you are making it into something it's not. You, you, are, you are setting atheism up as though atheism is ontological naturalism and that I have to come on here under this radio show as an atheist who doesn't necessarily tie in with all aspects of ontological naturalism and, and making me argue a point I'm not necessarily going to defend. I'm not going to necessarily agree with all philosophers when it comes to that. There are tons of atheist philosophers who disagree about about different aspects of ontological naturalism. So you're you're taking the word atheism. Atheism just means you don't believe in any of the theisms provided out there. That's all it means. You're taking that and going, okay, so you must be an evolutionist. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> it, it, we we have a thing that that talks about evolution. That is biology. That is not atheism. We have a thing that talks about morality without God. That's humanism. That's not atheism. We have a thing that talks about molecules and nature and logic existing. That's naturalism, Frank. That's not atheism. You are taking atheism and making it responsible for knowing all of these things that atheism is not claiming. David, I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with anything of what you're saying. There are, however, there are many atheists, the majority of atheists today, who say everything's made of molecules and there's nothing immaterial. I'm, I'm refuting that worldview. If you're an atheist that says there is an immaterial reality, great. Now I want to hear your explanation as to uh, okay. how this immoral, immaterial reality came to exist, hey, and why trust- our minds are rationally intelligible so we can uh, understand the real world. In other words, what explanation do you have without a god – uh, or in the absence of God, to account for immaterial reality? I would ask you that question. That's Perfect. my question. I, I, okay, good. I feel like I've already addressed it, but I'll do it again. And just so you know, when there are atheist conventions or secular conferences and in between the speeches, someone will get up and get up and give a talk about naturalism, about methodological naturalism. And then after all the talks are over, we're all sitting around in the, you know, um, uh, Lobby of the hotel. You were about to say that the bar, weren't you? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Most of them may, but but, uh, usually the bars are in the lobby. Hey, so Mm -hmm. so we'll all be sitting around the lobby of the hotel, all atheists, everyone in the room atheists, um, arguing about how we think the person was wrong about this or right about that, and then and then two atheists will start arguing about uh, cognition. Is it immaterial? Well, I believe it is immaterial. Well, where did it, well, no, it's happening with inside your brain, inside matter. And this is what I'm talking about. These types of disagreements and discussions happen even within atheist circles. So to of say that they do. atheists believe this certain way, it's just a mischaracterization of atheism. Uh, can, can, can I just, in can I just pop in here, David, um, just to say I, I, I totally get what you're saying. You don't want to wear a label you don't necessarily subscribe to you obviously are not comfortable with with being labeled a naturalist a materialist in that sense a hard going one in that sense but then a lot of people will say but i thought atheism was essentially the belief that there is nothing supernatural only natural things exist and, and most people take that to mean you know and maybe they're wrong to do it but to mean the physical stuff of life of you, the universe and that nothing beyond that realm exists and what you're saying is you're not necessarily saying that nothing but the the, the natural stuff of the world exists at that level i think people think okay well maybe the, this atheism isn't quite what i thought it was it sounds like there's more room for some kind of supernatural element to atheism than 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 is being let on i'm so glad you said that because uh, i know plenty of atheists and this may be shocking to lots of christians out there listening i know plenty of atheists who do acknowledge things that are immaterial i am not necessarily one of those unless you consider thoughts and cognition as immaterial and again those are debates that happen even within atheist circles some say yes a thought is immaterial because you can't touch it some people say but it happens within the brain so it is material Um, but there are atheists who have told me they believe they have conversations 
with their dead loved ones and that they believe their loved ones appear to them and talk with them. They are spiritual in that respect, but do not acknowledge Jesus or, or Muhammad or Krishna or, or any of these prophets or deities that are, that are, that have been proposed. So, so uh, again, tons of atheists. I, I have an email in my inbox right now of an atheist who believes that he can control rainbows, that when he requests a rainbow to appear, it appears for him. So, so atheists, you can't lump atheists in with, with logic, reason, and only materialistic because that's just not the case. And when you, when, you, when you tax atheism with coming up with answers, of course it's going to fail because atheism doesn't make those claims. So, but, but what you're actually doing is you're attacking a straw man version of atheism. If you want to attack naturalism, go after naturalism. If you want to attack humanism, I can argue with you about the morality of humanism. But but you 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 saying atheism is responsible for answering all of these questions, is is kind of like me saying that um, that 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 you know Christianity is responsible for answering every question of the universe. And if you can't answer every question of the universe, then Christianity fails. It, it just it, it just doesn't follow. So I I, I agree with largely what you said there, David. Uh, but something as as uh, foundational as the laws of logic and the laws of mathematics and our ability to rationally understand the universe is something I think that has to be part of any coherent worldview or view of the universe. I agree. And when you when you say that you don't have a worldview, uh, very first of all, that very statement, I, I don't that. have a worldview, is part of your worldview. If you're trying to right. deny you have a worldview, you're saying, well, I don't take any position. That's the position you're taking right then. And most of the atheists I read, and I, unfortunately I haven't gotten your book yet, but most of the athe- atheists I read have very strong beliefs. And many of them have have the belief of materialism. Others have the belief that the universe is the result of a quantum vacuum. Others have the belief that in order to get rid of God, we have the quantum vacuum, we have multiverses, we have uh, macroevolution. These are all explanations meant to show how the universe can be the way it is in the absence of any type of deity. So those are positive beliefs. They're positive beliefs in materialism. They're positive beliefs in in quantum vacuums and multiverses and macroevolution. It was Philip Johnson who famously said this, he said, he who is a skeptic in one set of beliefs is a true believer in another set of beliefs. So it's not just a lack of belief. You are okay. saying that certain things that uh, exist or, or certain aspects of reality you think are a certain way. Um, yes. You think well, humanism is better than Christianity morally. That's that's a positive belief. You, 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 you right. and I don't want to, again, put words in your mouth, but you have a certain worldview. And I think if we're going to be rational, intelligent, human beings who are seeking for truth, we have to have a view of the world that has adequate explanatory power and scope to explain the big issues that are around us. Where did we come from? Uh, How did we get here? Uh, How did the universe get here? Where did life come from? Where did subsequent life forms come from? Where did the laws of logic come from? Why? Why do they exist? The laws of mathematics. Why is the universe rationally intelligible? Why are there objective moral values and obligations? These are things that any coherent person should have, a truth-seeking person should have some kind of explanation and see where all that points to. Have we have, do we have it all figured out? No, but we just can't ignore these big aspects of reality and say that our worldview is an adequate worldview. We, yeah. Just a quick response, David, and then oh. we'll go to our break. Okay, fine. Um, Frank, I, I said a few moments ago, I do have a worldview. So you said that I said I don't have a worldview. That's simply not true. I said I have a worldview, uh, that my worldview is humanism. And then, and then I said I've gone back and forth. Is atheism a worldview? It depends on how you defend or define worldview. It's a view of the world, I suppose, but it, it's not an all-encompassing worldview. It doesn't answer all of these different questions for us. And as far as the laws of logic existing, I do take a position on that. I absolutely do. I do think the laws of logic exist, but they exist and were developed within the brains of human beings. Now, the question, would they exist if human brains cease to exist, that is a question philosophers and atheists will debate amongst each other that is not beholden to atheism to figure out. That's my point.
Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting discussion, guys. Um, we're going to continue after a short break. We're asking, have atheists been stealing from God? That's the contention of Frank Turek on Unbelievable Today. Frank is a Christian apologist, author and host of a US radio show himself called Cross Examined. His latest book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, is what we're discussing today with my atheist guest, David Smalley, host of the Dogma Debate Atheist Talk Show. And uh, you can find out more about both of them, uh, Cross Examined org for frank turek dogmadebate.com for david and uh, we'll continue this conversation after a very short break see you on the other side deliver us from evil in the february edition of premier christianity magazine we open up the real life world of exorcism and deliverance ministry separating fact from the hollywood fiction of demonic possession we also talk to the world's most influential bible scholar nt wright on why he's returning to the revolutionary cross of christ you'll learn about the six lies our worship music tells us and how we can fix them and we'll hear from the family law court judge delivering his evidence on why we need to save marriage for the good of the uk all that plus much more ask for your free sample copy at premierchristianity.com slash free sample welcome back to the final part of this week's unbelievable and we'll be hearing the final part of the discussion between my guests frank turek and david smalley in a moment's time uh, we've got some of your feedback to come as well i'm going to be answering a number of questions that i've sort of been stockpiling over the last few weeks and uh, see what i had to say about some of the things you've been asking me in terms of my response to certain theological conundrums and apologetics issues of course if you're looking for really top-notch responses to hard questions then unbelievable conference 2017 is a great place to go why not bring a group as well if you're part of a church it's it's a wonderful day out and I really enjoy meeting so many listeners to Unbelievable every year when we host the conference uh, again Saturday the 13th of May and uh, you can find more details at premier.org.uk forward slash why Christ uh, really looking forward to connecting again with John Lennox it's been some five years I think since he was last speaking at the conference uh, he's a renowned Christian thinker and speaker professor of mathematics at Oxford University just a brilliant raconteur as well he's got so many brilliant stories to tell they always come out when he's giving his talks and things uh looking to hopefully set up a show or two with him before the conference and andy bannister as well who's uh, also going to be at the conference this year who's i think a really gifted apologist and communicator uh, now working with solas center for public christianity up in scotland with david robertson and others but um those are just a couple of the names on the bill this year so uh, if you want to get yourself along there now's the time to book in while the early bird prices are available uh, premier.org.uk forward slash why christ uh, just a quick shout out to levi smith on facebook who got in touch to say i'm in the united states i used to listen to your podcast as i worked the night shift as a security guard while studying in seminary i'm now a youth pastor and recently heard about the podcast again on cross-examined with frank turek just wanted to say thank you so much for what you do sincerely hope i can make it out there someday but in the meantime i want to get back to listening to your podcast god bless you well god bless you too levi um so glad that my appearance on frank's show last weekend has made you want to connect with the podcast again and uh, anyone listening who wants to listen to that episode i recorded with frank turek of his show cross examined it's available crossexamined.org uh, we're going to be hearing more of your feedback later on in the show but let's get back into the final part of today's discussion you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio Welcome back to today's programme, final part of the show. Uh, my conversation on Unbelievable Today is between Frank Turek and David Smalley. They're both actually hosts of their own shows. Um, Frank is a Christian apologist, author and host of Cross Examined, a US radio call-in show. And uh, he's been talking about his book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And saying to our atheist guest, David Smalley, who's the host of the Dogma Debate Show, that as an atheist, you have to steal the idea of reason and logic in order to make your very case against. God. Well, David has pushed back and said, as an atheist, he's not required really to anything more than saying God doesn't exist and he doesn't see any evidence for God. Um, the rest of the stuff you can debate and, and so on, and that's all fine, but not something that's required by his atheism as such. Now, Frank, y your p problem seems to be with this, that um, as far as you can see, the existence of, of the laws of logic and reason comport well. They're consistent with a Christian worldview. Um, they can be grounded in something beyond nature and, and, and so on. 
Um, and and this idea that David's atheism doesn't have to kind of answer to that issue, that problem, um, you, you're saying, well, actually, we all have, in the end, to, to kind of explain our position in the universe. And just saying, well, I'm agnostic on these things doesn't, doesn't necessarily let David off the hook in that sense. And we'll let David back in on this, of course, in a moment. But, but do you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, I, I mean, David just tried to say before the break that uh, these laws, these laws of logic are human conceptions. If that were the case, we talked about this earlier, but if that were the case, he and I couldn't, couldn't even communicate with one another. Because if I just had in my mind my own conceptions of the laws of logic, and he had in his mind his own conception of the laws of logic, uh, then there would be no way we could communicate. We have to both be accessing the same laws of logic that are external to our minds in order to communicate. In other words, those objective, unchanging laws are the bridge between minds. We use that bridge, but we did not create that bridge. These are not just human conventions. And the very phrase or the very claim, these are just human conventions, that very claim itself defeats itself. Because if the laws of logic are human conventions, then then the claim, the laws of logic are human conventions, are isn't in an objective truth either. It's just it's just a subjective outgrowth of of my brain. And so my the question I'd like to ask David and 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 just to see how he responds is David is this if your brain evolved by an unguided unintelligent process and all your thoughts are completely dictated by the laws of physics in other words you're just a moist robot then why should we think your thoughts are true including your thoughts that atheism are true again the comment that atheism is true asserts that atheism is making a positive claim so I'm not really sure what you're asking when you say that I need to tell you something that makes you believe atheism is true. I, I, I think you're misunderstanding atheism by asking the question that way. I'm, I'll give you a chance to reword it because maybe I misunderstood. Okay, how about how – about, right, I'll just use your, your, your humanism. If your brain evolved by unguided, unintelligent processes and all your thoughts are completely dictated by the laws of physics, you're just a moist robot, then why should you think your thoughts about the way the universe really is are true, including your thoughts that humanism is true? It's, it's all we have to work with is what we know and our, the laws of logic we understand. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why anyone else would have to think it's true. Hopefully I could persuade them explain to them from my perspective the way I think the world operates and if it comports with the way you think we're, we're on the same page and if not we have a philosophical debate about it. Uh, it, it not everything has to be either true or false we can have discussions and, and there's a level of gray area and I think what you continue to do over and over in, in, in this discussion is create false dichotomies you consistently exclude the middle of people disagreeing on these same topics with, under, with being under the same umbrella. So there's well, not there is some, yes or no answer to these types of questions. There is something called the law of the excluded middle, and that means that either a statement is true or it's false. Now, we might not know if it's true or false, but the statement either is true or it's false. For example, the statement that Christianity is true or that Jesus rose from the dead is either true or it's false. We may not know if it's true or false, but it either is true or false, correct? Well, but the entire point of your book is proving that in order for me to know the answer to any question, I have to steal from God in order to know that. And I'm telling you, people develop these ideas in their brains, and they're able to determine these answers to these questions without a belief in any deity at all, including a belief in other deities that you don't believe in. So if I Again. can – so if, if I can develop these things uh, within humanism and through evolution, and if Hindus can know right from wrong and understand laws of logic, and if Muslims can understand right from wrong and understand laws of logic, and ancient Egyptians can do the same thing, your God isn't necessary for me to steal from. Again, let me, let me, let me just say that a little bit different way, um, and that is um, we can know what a book says and deny there's an author. Right. But there would be no book to know unless there was an author. Similarly, we can know the laws of logic and deny there's a source for the laws of logic, but there would be no laws of logic to know unless that source existed. And it's my contention is, is that source is an immaterial mind we know is God. These laws are rational and our minds are built 
in the in the image of the great mind. And the reason we can know reality and know what the universe does is because these laws exist and our minds are built to know what the universe is through these laws and through our senses. So I'm not denying – you can be an atheist and use the laws of logic every day, but if, 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 if my um, – position is right here. What I'm saying is, is that while you can use the laws of logic, you can't justify them from an atheistic, materialistic point of view. Now, you may not be a materialist. I'm still going to ask you if there is no being known as God, if there is no external supernatural mind, where do these laws of logic come from? I've answered it three times. It comes from human development within our brain. And I want you to, I want you to point out, I, mean, I want to point out, Muslims could use the exact same argument against you. Oh, yeah, you can use logic and reason all you want to and pretend that it came from the Christian God, but what you're really doing is you're using the laws and logic provided to you by Allah. Praise Allah, Allah Akbar. Like this, yeah, they, I, I, same I, thing I agree with that, David. Consider you and consider you worshiping a false god. To say that the reason and logic came from God to me is so upside down because the very thought of God itself is unreasonable and illogical. Does it, is, is it within the laws of logic? For a dead Jew to come back to life? No. Is it within the laws of logic to believe that a God always existed for billions of years, then created us, knowing ahead of time that billions of us would suffer eternity in hell, yet he loves us? Is that within the laws of logic? Is, is it within the laws of logic and reason? Is it reasonable to think that man was made from dirt and a woman was made from his rib? Very few things about the Bible fall within logic or reason. There is a talking donkey and a talking snake and, and tons of ridiculous, far-fetched stories. And for you to say that all of this is based in logic and reason, frankly, it's, it's backwards. Do you, do you want to just um, start to wrap things up, Frank? And, and obviously, David's opened up well a big can of worms there essentially right at the end to say you know well you've been talking about reason and logic all this time but i just don't see that it's that the bible is terribly logical or reasonable now that's not quite your point i suppose is it overall but but you know t uh, we're, we're getting towards the end here so how, how do you want to start to conclude things frank well uh, again i think that if you're going to have a coherent view of the world you have to deal – or you have to have an explanation. You might not know what the explanation is yet, but you, you, you have to have some explanation for how we have an ability to reason and why these laws of logic exist because everything else we know depends on the laws of logic and our ability to reason, no matter what worldview we have. And I'm saying that appears to be best grounded in a mind. And we could talk on another program about whether the Bible uh, is is good or bad or whether there are good things or bad things going on in the Bible. Actually, logic has nothing to do whether it, whether or not a donkey can talk. OK, that has nothing to do with the laws of logic. It has to do with whether or not there is a supernatural being who could cause a donkey to talk. And that's certainly a logical uh, possibility. It's not against logic to say that God exists and can cause a donkey to talk. I think it's unreasonable. Um, so, I think it's unreasonable. So, well, no, it's not unreasonable at all because if there is a God, he can he he can cause a donkey to talk. I mean, that's the whole point. And so, I, I thought our our discussion today was supposed to be focused on this issue of reason. David wants to take it elsewhere. That's fine. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about other things at another time. But I just wanted to stay on this issue because this issue is foundational to every other issue. You can't create a worldview without reason or the laws of logic. And if David wants to persist in saying that the laws of logic are just con human conceptions, then there's no way any of us could communicate with one another. These laws of logic are – are outside of our minds that we can access by our minds. They are immaterial, they are unchanging, and they appear to me anyway to be grounded in what's known as a mind. We're going to have to start to wrap things up, David. Thank you for being on the program as well today. Obviously, I wasn't expecting you to uh, to, to agree <laughs> with Frank, and you've done a, a great job at presenting your, your side of this. Um, uh, hey, maybe you could carry on the conversation on dogma debate with Frank at some point, because uh, I'm sure there's plenty more to be uncovered. But, um, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, I think it's been been helpful to hear what you said as well about just the fact that, um, obviously, many people who call themselves atheists don't necessarily subscribe to the, the naturalism that Frank obviously feels is undermined by by reason and logic and so on. Um, 
having said that, I mean, I, I think a lot of people do kind of assume that's where the intellectual atheists are at, you know, the ones who maybe are, are leading the culture, you know, the, D- Dawkins, uh, Sam Harris, Dennett and so on. They all strike me as, as probably subscribing to some form of naturalism. Um, so, well, you know, they do, but, but they do disagree with each other on those aspects. They debate one another. In fact, um, Dennett and Harris have been teasing for over a year now to debate free will. Uh, do you really have free will? Uh, Dennett says yes, but he doesn't call it free will. Sam Harris will argue that no, your your uh, your actions are properties of chemicals bouncing around in your brain, and they're both atheists. So so m- my point is not to to uh, obfuscate this whole discussion. I'm I'm trying to stay on topic, but the whole point is reason and logic. In, in Frank's book, is in order for me to use reason and logic, I have to steal from his God in order to use it. My whole point is. Atheists and and all sorts of people who reject that God completely disagree about the same aspects that Frank is saying, all atheists say this, and I think atheism is wrong. It's a mischaracterization of atheism to think that we all agree about reason and logic. So well, I, I believe reason and logic does exist. Is it Was it developed in human brains? Perhaps. I've seen two atheists argue that. No, it wasn't developed. It was discovered. So it's always existed? Perhaps. Well, could it exist without human minds? Not really. Like these are types of discussions that atheists have. So to so to task atheism with coming up with these answers is a mischaracterization okay. of what atheism is. Well, look, it's been great having you on the program. Frank, thank you very much for making the case as well from your book. And uh, if people want to get hold of it, they can they can find links, I'm sure, at uh, crossexamine.org. Is that correct? Yes, they can. And uh, if they go into a bookstore and it's not there, it's just sold out again. You know how that happens, Justin. <laughs> Obviously, obviously. <laughs> in, in any case, um, David. Thanks, uh, David. Thanks for a spirited debate. You know, I, I love uh, a kind of a spirited debate. So thanks for doing that, David. You're well spoken. And uh, although we don't agree, uh, maybe we can do this again and uh, tackle uh, tackle another issue or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to it, and I, I would love to have you on Dogma Debate as well. Great, yes, sir. I appreciate All right. that. Let's do that. Hey, well, I've enjoyed hosting two other hosts uh, on Unbelievable Today. Bit of an unusual uh, scenario uh, to be able to do that. But uh, David and Frank, thank you both for being on the program today again crossexamine.org for frank dogmadebate.com for david and uh, we're going to be looking at some of your feedback to recent editions of the show in a moment's time do stick with me this is unbelievable unbelievable with justin Brierley. As ever, if you want to get in touch about anything you've heard on the show today, send me your responses. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk is the email address. Uh, You can also leave a comment underneath today's show at the show website, premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. We amass hundreds of comments underneath each show each week. And of course, you can get in touch via social media at unbelievablejb for the Twitter, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb to to like the show page and uh, you'll get regular updates there as well on other things that I think might interest you. I've had quite a few emails over the last few weeks of people asking me different things and so I thought I'd I'd take some time now just to try and give my responses to one or two of them. But firstly though, uh, Jim Grove, another new listener, says, found your podcast a month or two ago. I'm already hooked, love the show. You do a great job. Listening through old episodes and I'm not caught up yet so if you've already covered this subject please let me know which episode so I'm sure not to miss it. But I'd love to hear an episode about consciousness. Does the brain generate consciousness or receive it. Uh, You could have even Alexander on to discuss it with someone who comes from a materialist perspective. Well, Jim, as you can imagine, in 11 years now of doing the show, we have covered consciousness a few times. I've sent you, in fact, a few suggestions of shows you might want to listen to from the past. We have done one with Aben Alexander, talking more about near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences in that case. I think you'll have to search back a couple of years to find that one, but there's also shows in the in the archive between uh, Keith Ward and Michael Roos on mind and consciousness, uh, equally Keith Ward versus David Papineau. I think that was in January 2012, um, whether our mind is more than matter. Uh, we had, um, going back to 2010, uh, an interesting program called Wired for God, The Biology of Spiritual Experience. I think that was Susan Blackmore and Charles Foster. And uh, I really enjoyed the the debate between Cesar Bernstein and Arif Ahmed, um, again, a couple of years ago, uh, the argument from consciousness to God. So there's a few few episodes to possibly whet your appetite with. Um, Charisma got in touch, Christian listener in New York City. Just had a quick question for Justin. How do you undergird your faith and not remain in doubt after hearing all the opposing ideas on your shows? 
this is a common question I get, charisma. And in a sense, the book I've written, which will be coming out in time for this year's conference, I'll be launching it there and, and speaking myself about the book and, uh, and the journey of Unbelievable, how it's uh, shaped me as a Christian. Um, it, that book is very much a response to your question. How, after all these years of listening to so many objections from atheists and sceptics, do I still remain a Christian? And, and uh, the fact is I, I still have found the case for Christianity to be a compelling one. Um, obviously, it's more than just the intellectual arguments. I, I am a Christian for more than just intellectual reasons. I believe that I had an experience which, in which I came to know Jesus Christ in a, in a way that transcends at some level the intellect. But at the same time, I think the intellectual experiences we have, the experience we have, the world, the nature of the world, the nature of what we perceive as reality – all make sense in the Christian worldview. So I think there's a number of different ways. Um, I could encourage you, I'm sounding like a terrible salesman, but if you want to read the full story, obviously get the book when it when it comes out. But thanks for getting in touch. Um, uh, Andy says, have you seen Alex J. O'Connor's, a.k.a. Cosmic Skeptic, rebuttal of your Cosmic Dice video? It would be good to get him on the show debating someone maybe of a similar age. I think he's only 17 years old and you send me a link to his video. Yes, I have. I think I've mentioned this actually a few episodes back that uh, uh, other people made me aware that a particular atheist YouTuber, um, Cosmic Skeptic, had done a kind of response video to my How a Dice Can Show That God Exists video, um, which has done surprisingly well. The the, the video, uh, it's had a, over, I think, 320,000 hits now on YouTube, um, the, the Dice video I made, and about 6,000 comments beneath it. Um, but um, I'm, I'm seeing if we can set something up with Alex to talk about that video again. Uh, because it obviously is uh, reaching a lot of people online. I never expected it really to, to do that well. But uh, there you go. That's great. Uh, here's an email I received from Dave from Hitchin here in the UK. And uh, he asked a couple of questions. Um, said, I'm a relative newcomer to the show, but a massive fan, plowing my way through the back catalogue. Thanks for reviewing what I believe is the most thought-provoking content on radio or TV. Uh, coming from an atheistic standpoint, I'd say that the show's output has at least shifted me towards cautious but inquiring agnosticism. Let's see how this journey progresses. Uh, and you say a couple of suggestions for future shows. One, why did Jesus perform miracles? question that's got me in a spin assuming he did do miracles then what was the reason was he trying to fulfill old testament prophecies or was he just being compassionate and healing the sick but if the latter then how does that square with the problem of evil and suffering and god's grand plan of allowing suffering for a reason were those sick or disabled or recently deceased people just put on this earth by god so that he or jesus could later cure them to prove a point or create waves or fulfill a prophecy and then the second show you thought would be worth exploring something on is the moral argument you say okay it's been gone over before but surely experience and history shows that moral values aren't set in stone and are relative according to time place and culture in previous centuries slavery was accepted torture capital punishment forced marriage and scores of other practices now seen as barbaric are allowed they were accepted practices in former times and most of the population didn't seem to have a moral problem with them in that era these days, attitudes to same-sex relationships, marital rape, animal welfare, mental health have all shifted significantly over just the past few decades. Even today, attitudes and morals in a Western European country are very different to those in, say, Islamic State territory. Surely this blows the moral argument for the existence of God right out of the water. Moral values clearly are set by the human culture or community of a given time or place. Surely they must be relative and not God-defined, or am I missing something? Anyway, sorry for the extended email. You can clearly see you and your guests have got me thinking maybe you could cover off some of these questions in a future episode. Well, uh, in fact, on the moral argument, we're setting something up with next week, in fact. We're going to be having atheist Corey Markham and Christian John Cranman debating that issue because um, Corey, who's been on the show a couple of times before now, has written an interesting paper on why he doesn't think the moral argument works and John has been having a dialogue with him and, and they'll be coming on to join me for, for that. And, and I'll certainly ask that question myself of them for on your behalf, David. But here's my go at giving a brief response to both of those issues you raised. Firstly, this issue of uh, Jesus performing miracles. Um, well, I think it's perfectly feasible that Jesus could perform miracles both as a sign of his lordship, his messiahship, as a fulfillment of prophecies, and out of compassion for the people he healed. Um, the miracles themselves, I don't think, particularly fulfill Old Testament prophecies. That's more linked to the circumstances of Jesus' birth and death and resurrection and so on. But I don't think that God healing people is a problem for the view that God may allow suffering in some instances because of some greater purpose it produces. I think God can work both through healing people 
and allowing suffering in order to bring about his purposes. I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction between those two. Um, and I think that's manifest most obviously in the life of Christ himself, where obviously many followed him because of his miracles. That was their route to coming to God. But his suffering was ultimately what fulfills God's greatest purposes in terms of bringing people to himself. So I, I don't think of them as, as somehow mutually exclusive. Um, uh, regarding the moral argument and people who know this show and have listened to me for years on end will know that this is a, a drum I bang every so often. Um, I get your point, but I do disagree. Um, I don't think most people really think about moral values as being simply culturally specific and, you know, changing from time to time. Now, of course, generally the, the moral zeitgeist changes over time. But I would say that simply because if you really believe now that marital rape is wrong, then it's always been wrong. Um, it's just that people were, you know, were wrong about that in the past. And we've discovered the truth of the matter. Uh, take racism. Maybe segregation was the predominant view in the 1930s America. But that just means that those people who agreed with it then were wrong. And there is a moral fact of the matter. And people who held a different view were mistaken about it. And even moral sort of relativists who talk about things like moral progress, I think you can only talk about progress if there is some independent standard we're progressing towards. So otherwise, it's simply moral change, but no one's in a position to say whether anything is right or wrong, um, which, which direction we're going in and so on. And the other problem, I think, for the relativist, it means that they don't think they have any particular right to criticise people in other cultures if they are doing things that they judge to be wrong like child slavery or female genital mutilation or whatever it might be, because they're, they're sim that's simply their opinion versus someone else's opinion. But it, but that's not the case if there is a real fact of the matter. And most people, I think, honestly, when they actually think about it, do think there's a re reality to, to morality. Um, wow, uh, out of time already. What a shame. And more questions here I would have liked to address but uh, we'll leave it there for the moment i'll just say thank you for listening to this week's show hope you can come back at the same time next week i got that really interesting discussion that i just mentioned coming up for you between Corey markham and john cranman you're unbelievable we're going to be debating the moral argument for god in particular whether god can ground objective morality uh, our atheist guest Corey markham says he doesn't see how that would work so whether or not you believe in objective moral values god's not going to help you ground them even if atheists might have a problem grounding them themselves well and we'll look into that subject that we've been talking about there about whether um, objective morality really does seem to exist or not uh, maybe other ethical systems that atheists have put forward to explain our understanding of morality so we'll we'll be doing the rounds on this subject which comes up very often on unbelievable we'll be devoting a, a show to it same time next week hope you can join me for that in the meantime thanks for listening to unbelievable coming up next the profile